Welcome everyone to today's devotion. We find ourselves in Luke chapter 13, so we're on the uh, second half of the book. Um, and so I believe in about two weeks, we'll roughly we'll, we'll be done, maybe a little more than that. Um, but the, the emphasis of Luke chapter 13 is repentance. It is Jesus pleading with uh, his fellow Jews that they would repent and enter the kingdom of God. Notice uh, where it begins. It, it, it begins with this theme in, in a surprising way. Chapter 13 says, There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? There's some debate exactly what, what event transpired, um, but Pilate had a history of... of um, uh, violence against the Jews. Um, and so it's likely that one of those events is being referenced here. And the question is, did these people suffer because they were bad people? Right? That is the sort of question you get in a religious system. That bad things happen to bad people, good people, good things happen to good people. And, and the problem with that is we all know deep down it is false. We all know that the righteous suffer. And the wicked prosper. We all we've all seen that. It doesn't mean that everyone who is righteous suffers and everyone who's wicked uh, prospers. What it does mean is that this world is a messy place um, to where we there's a lot of gray that we, we can't just say good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. But that's the question that's being asked here. Um, Jesus answers, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Notice what Jesus did there. Jesus isn't really dealing with the question of suffering there, is he? Rather, he's saying, look, moments of tragedy like this are a reminder to each of us that we must repent. That, that life is not something that is guaranteed. We, we are not guaranteed to have today or tomorrow. No, the priority must be repent and believe the gospel. I mean, what an important message we need to hear right now amid an invisible pandemic that could come and take any of us right now. Perhaps there are some watching right now who, who have had this disease or are suffering from it or may not even know or will soon catch it. We, we just don't know. The priority for Jesus is simply will you in light of such threats, in light of such a dangerous world we live in, will you not repent? And so uh, he goes on, verse 14, let's look at another example Jesus says. Those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who live in Jerusalem? Again, he's saying, look, we can look at every tragedy that's ever happened in this nation, and, and you're wrong to think that that happened because all those people were bad people. You know, the, the, the sun shines on the righteous and the wicked. The, the, the floods come for the righteous and the wicked, right? Good and bad things happen to us all. The question is, are you ready now for when those things happen? We must all give account for the life that we have lived. Are we ready for that day? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And this sets up the emphasis of chapter 13. And so, although for sake of time we won't, we won't look at any detail, uh, verse 6 to 9 is a parable of the uh, barren fig tree, right? Um, to where, where the, the servant comes and reinvests in this, this tree that isn't bearing fruit and the hopes that next year, the year after that, it will bear fruit. But then it says, if it will not bear fruit, cut it down. That is to say, repent and believe or you will perish. And then we get the story of the woman with the, uh, um, the, the disabling spirit. Uh, she's described in verse 11 as she is bent over and could not fully straighten herself. And this has been going on for 18 years. So Jesus says to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. And she's healed. Right? And, of course, religious people get upset. Now remember, when I say religious people, I'm not just talking about people who sit in the pews. I'm also talking about those who in self-righteous uh, storm streets write uh, ridiculous op-eds in New York Times and yada, 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 right? Secular and traditional religion are equally religious. And what you're going to get in religion is this sort of nonsense. Here what you have is a man who is described as being indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. See, when you do things that go against the, the order of the religious hierarchy, then you will be condemned. And Jesus couldn't care less. 
is this, his response is quite simple. Uh, we, we saw this with the uh, man with the withered hand. Um, a withered hand is bad, right? It's not ideal. A fully functioning hand is good, right? Uh, I don't understand why, why this is so uh, difficult. Um, and, and we're getting that place in many ways in, in our secular age in that we, we will tolerate what, are, what is bad because we don't want to uh, interrupt the system that we have. Anyways, um, so Jesus says, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And out does this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from his bond on the Sabbath day? His, his, issues, his, his response is quite straightforward. He says, Do not even you, you hypocrites, remember the, the leaven of the Pharisees, it's hypocrisy, do, do not even you guys that Will you not go untie your domesticated animals, the animals you need for your farm? Do you, do you not, if, if there is a, an emergency even on the Sabbath, do you not take care of it? Of course you do. And is this woman not more valuable than your domesticated animal? Of course. She's an image bearer of God. She is a daughter of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Should we not be kind to her? After all, she's been suffering for 18 years. Now is the time. For her to be healed and to be touched by the Savior. Well, let us skip down to verse 22. Um, here we, we see some of the same themes showing up. And here um, we have a passage that is taken from the Sermon on the Mount. This is the narrow door passage. And Jesus says, verse 24, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter it and will not be able to. Um, there, 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 there's a, a couple of beautiful scenes in uh, Pilgrim's Progress that illustrates this. That Pilgrim, uh, the, the Pilgrim Christian, goes through this this narrow gate, uh, the Wicket Gate, the Wicket with a T, not with a D, the Wicket Gate. It's a small narrow gate uh, that gets him on the right pathway, um, and he meets people along the way who went around. Uh, they want to take a shortcut. They want to go through through a more broad way. Uh, I love how Bunyan illustrates some of that in uh, Pilgrim's Progress. If you've not read Pilgrim's Progress, during this lockdown, that should probably be a priority for you. Um, but so, so Jesus says, enter through the, the narrow gate. How do you enter through the narrow gate? You enter by the means of repentance. Right? It's the theme of the chapter. Then he shows that there will be some who think they're entitled to the kingdom of God, but will not enter it. So Jesus, uh, in this parable, they will begin to say, verse 26, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in, in, in your streets. Notice, they believe that they should be in the kingdom of God simply by association. Like, uh, you know, Jesus, we once shook hands, and we were friends on Facebook. Surely, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. And how many to this day think that because they are, in their eyes, a good person, or because they were baptized when they were a kid, or because they've done the rituals of religion, or because... They may claim to be a Christian, that therefore they're safe. And Jesus says, no, the only way you will enter the kingdom of God is through the narrow gate of repentance. It's narrow not because only a few get there, but only a few are willing to go through the process of repentance in order to enter. So maybe that is you. Maybe you think in watching these devotions make you a righteous person. No, ask yourself, have I truly repented of my sin? Have you truly repented? Repented. Well, then we get, in conclusion, Jesus' uh, lamentation over Jerusalem. And the lamentation is uh, that the city, the people of the city, refuse to repent. So he will say in verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen, gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. It's, it's interesting the uh, uh, matriarchal language that Jesus is using here. That he, he, he describes himself as a hen who, who would gather his chicks under his wings. Um, but the city, the people of the city will not repent. And thus will be destroyed. You see then that the whole chapter is, Will you not repent? or else perish. Enter the narrow gate. Bear the fruits of repentance, for there will be judgment. It is my prayer that this time of COVID would be a time of self-reflection, 
and that we will take spiritual matters more seriously than we take political matters, economic matters, and all the other stuff. And that begins with repentance. Lord willing, see you guys here Monday.